currently looking at the mobile launcher platform and one of the solid rocket boosters. ICE team is on the uh, zero level of the platform, making inspections, uh, scanning the uh, orbiter vehicle, uh, recording temperatures, and uh, making note of any, any, uh, anything that looks unusual. One of, the, one of the activities the team performs at this level is uh, pulling down of some sensors that are located in between the uh, space shuttle orbiter and the external tank. You can see the, uh, the lines to those sensors are uh, to the left-hand side of, of the booster, in between the two boosters. Once the ICE team finishes their inspection, they'll be coming back here to the Launch Control Center, and they'll make a report to launch controllers on, uh, on their findings at the launch pad. The STS-65 crew has been preparing for about a year for this flight today. Got a, yeah, this, today will be the beginning of their 14 days on orbit. And we have a picture of uh, Bob Cabana now, commander of this flight. He's just completed a weather briefing and uh, very optimistic today about today's launch. Cabana is a member of the red team for mission STS-65. STS-65 pilot, Jim Halsell. Also a member of the red team, flying for the first time today on the space shuttle. Mission specialist and payload commander for this flight, Rick Hebe. He's flying for the third time today on the space shuttle. He's a member of the red team. He'll be working inside the IML space lab as part of the science crew with some primary responsibility for activities going on in flight. And across the room, we've got mission specialist Carl Walls. Ready to go today? Walls is a member of the blue team. Mission specialist Leroy Chow. He's part of the Space Lab Science crew. He's flying for the first time today. Mission Specialist Don Thomas. Thomas is born in Cleveland, Ohio. He's a member of the blue team, flying for the first time today. And we have Japanese payload specialist, Chiaki Mukai. She's making history in Japan as the first woman to fly into space from, from Japan. Mukai is a member of the red team and is also part of the Space Lab Science crew. She'll be involved in the science activities going on in the International Microgravity Laboratory for the flight. Commander Bob Cabana, got pilot uh, Jim Halsell. Good morning. Thank you all. We're going to have a great flight. Thank you. Flight crew will be making uh, communications checks with 
the test conductors here at KSC and also at flight at uh, Mission Control. They'll be talking to the uh, flight controllers there. MS1, loud and clear. MS2, loud and clear. MS3, loud and clear. MS4, loud and clear. Yes, one, loud and clear. Copy, heavy loud and clear also, going back there to ground one. T minus eight minutes and counting. TLT, OTC. OTC, TLT, that is complete. Okay, I copy. NTD Houston flight. I'll go for it. Yes, at this time I'd like to give a go for the RTLS weather, both the observed and forecast uh, conditions, and we're go for launch. I copy, thank you, launch director. Launch director, NTD 212. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Flight has cleared his weather constraint and air go, and that puts us fully ready to proceed. Okay, stand by and uh, MMP chairman. Roger, our uh, weather constraint is cleared. Cleared launch. Okay, copy. Well, with that NTD, you can take out the whole pending at five minutes and see if we can keep the clock going for another seven. TLS copies. I'll do that. Thank you. TLS is go. Open or access arm retract. T minus seven minutes and counting. We've gotten a clearance to launch today. RTLS weather has uh, is going to hold out for us for a 12:43 p.m. Eastern time launch. Also, the weather at our TAL site is also clear for launch today. The orbiter's access arm is being retracted away from the vehicle at this time. MS2. OTC CL. Go ahead. The uh, fast heaters are still on. Copy. CDR OTC. Roger. Flash step speed line heaters coming off. OTC CDR, that's complete. Copy. The gaseous oxygen vent hood is now being retracted away from the shuttle. I'd like to wish you all a very successful two weeks on orbit, and with that, uh, close and lock your visors and initiate O2 flow. Roger, thanks, Randy, and initiating O2 flow. The LSS goes for ET, LH2, pressurization. T minus 20 seconds. 15. Minus 10, 9, 8. We have a go for engine start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Booster ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of Columbia on a multi nation research flight. Mission Columbia, roll program. Roger, roll, Columbia. Houston now controlling Columbia underway on its 17th trip to space. Columbia already traveling 250 miles an hour. Three engines on board Columbia now throttling back to two-thirds throttle to prepare the spacecraft to pass through the area of maximum air pressure and go supersonic. Columbia, go at throttle up. Columbia's three engines now back at full throttle.
Cruise draw officer confirms a good separation of the solid rockets. Altitude now 172,000 feet. Columbia 33 miles east of the Kennedy Space Center. Now traveling 3,500 miles an hour. Okay. Well, I have Don Lincoln uh, mid-deck through the camcorder, and uh, if you should have a still picture of us sitting on the flight deck right now. That's affirmative. We got a real good picture, boss. Okay, well, here it comes. I'll narrate. This is just after main engine start, and the solids are going to light off here, and we're going uphill. We just completed the, uh, the roll program there. I'll tell you, it was a beautiful day for a launch. Uh, the main engines lit on time, and uh, Carl was a little worried uh, from his previous flights. Not worried, but uh, he doesn't get excited until the solids lit. And then when the uh, solids lit, we, uh, we took off. It was great. I wish we could uh, show you what you were seeing out the windows. Uh, unfortunately, where the camera's uh, placed, all we can get is uh, the shaking inside. It, uh, as you can see, vibrates breaks pretty good on the uh, solids, and uh, we're being pushed back in our seats a fair amount, but uh, nothing compared to the last two minutes of the uh, flight when the main engines are really accelerating us out to our uh, orbital velocity. I tell you, Bob, from our perspective, this is uh, great footage. Uh, uh, We've just never seen anything quite like it. Well, pay attention. We're coming up to uh, SRB-7 pretty soon here. You can see the flash out the front windows. Jim and I have cue cards over the HUD to block the sunlight coming in so we can see all the displays, but you'll still see the uh, flash from the set motors around the sides of them. CLS is go from an engine start. All vents open. T0, SRB ignition. Lift off confirmed. Houston, Columbia, roll program. Roger, roll, Columbia. People sees the roll. Thank you. Right, didn't your Delta State processor look good? Looks good. Thank you. Booster, how the three engines look? Negative return. Columbia Houston, negative return. Booster flying? Go oh, flying. Right three right engines look down. solid. Three engines look real good flying. Thank you. Prop, you go for the photo DTO? Go. I don't know how we doing it, Miko. Uh, nominal velocity flight. No underspeed, no zone required. 
Capcom for this. Okay. Capcom. ET sub. Okay. Nominal. Columbia Houston, nominal Miko, no ohms, one required. Go for the ET photo DTO. Roger, go for the ET photo DTO, nominal Miko, pulse X in work. Thirty seconds, hand over to Tedris. Power this is Jim trying to float for the first time in his life. Go for it, man. This feels really weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to call the ground here. Jim is floating. Houston, Columbia, KG Band, antenna deploy. All nominal. CPL. You do. Okay. It smells like a lab. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the next step? Open hatch for key detail. Turn the light on. Glad to see you folks uh, come floating out of the tunnel, and uh, now we're assured that this just, just isn't a mock-up somewhere on the ground. Well, we had to look out the window and make sure that there's really a space lab out there. Electrophoresis unit is used to separate uh, proteins, and what we're doing today is we're trying to separate a mixture of proteins by applying an electric field uh, against the uh, current, a, uh, the flow of a buffer solution with the sample stream of the uh, protein. Okay, I'll just kind of go from top to bottom here. Okay. This is the Ramsey's facility here, and on the top is the power supply followed by the uh, control and display keyboard here where we control all the pumps and you know input all the different things. This is the stowage, one of the stowage compartments. And here we have the different sample trays for the different experiments we're going to run. Um, we have in here drawers that slide out. These are the sample bags here. This is uh, the sample of the stuff that we're going to separate. We also have some more of these sample things in the crib, and after we're done collecting, we freeze the samples in the crib. Coming down, this is the uh, main cell here. This is where the electrophoresis happens. And uh, here's the cell buffer pump. It's a peristaltic pump with a bunch of different tubes, and just that's the medium that the uh, this, that you separate the stuff in. This is the sample compartment. The sample just slides right in here. 
another peristaltic pump pumps the sample up through the uh, chamber where it then you know kind of separates like that. And this is the uh, collection area, this is the collection tray. And uh, the different, each 41, uh, it collects every 41, all 41 samples, different ports. And this is just some uh, some of the plumbing of the equipment, you know, the different fluid loops, a couple of valves, things like that. And that, in a nutshell, is the Ramsey's facility. I'm standing here next to Biorack. I think of Biorack as sort of a, a mini space station because it's got these are fruit flies, one of many experiments. There's some 200 containers with different science going on in most of them. It's got centrifuges for 1G controls. You can see those in the background. It's got incubators that run at two different temperatures. And there's experiments from all over the world in Biorack. So it's a lot of fun to work because there's a lot of different things. It's got its own cooler. And down below, it's got a glove box so that we can work with uh, toxic things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to work with in space because we can keep them contained inside the glove box. So here I'm putting some things in there. And here's a shot from right in front, just as I'm loading some things into the centrifuge. We stop the centrifuge, put some containers in. That way we can do controls on board, do the exact same thing. They're in the exact same environment, except that some are being spun at 1G and some are being kept at 0G. And today, just for example, besides the fruit flies, I've irrigated some lentil seeds, which are going to... Uh, be growing in space, and then we'll fix them later and sort of capture their development. Here I'm getting, getting into stowage for uh, Nizimi, which lives right next to Biorack, and has a lot of uh, similarity or a lot of uh, relationship with Biorack. It's different in that it's got a variable speed centrifuge. Meanwhile, Chiaki is over on the, uh, at the workbench rack uh, working on some experiments that will go into FFEU. Here we're bar she's borrowing the Biorack glove box to do to, to inject some fluids from one syringe into another. She's going to use these to run in the FFEU electrophoresis unit, which we were able to rescue by her sort of repeated IFMs uh, earlier in the week. So we've been very happy to get to do some FFEU work because it's one of the facilities on board. And in fact, it was the last facility to repair. We've now had all the facilities work. And in fact, we kind of added up over the course of the flight. We've been able to rescue significant parts of five of the uh, of the 20 or so facilities on board with IFMs between the newt, removing the newt, which was required to keep the uh, fish package alive, and repairing the Eris echo machine, which was required for both EDOMP and the Canadian spinal changes in microgravity, and then, of course, the FFEU that I already talked about, and the sort of lucky touch with the fingers to get the HRM data from the uh, RRMD. Jackie's using a microscope here, just as you would on the ground, to look at the condition of the cells that are in these little cassettes. Here's a look at the madaka, the fish that are in one of those little packages. Two, two males, two fem females. In the lower right corner, you might be able to pick out uh, some eggs. It's a little bit hard to tell that.
Leroy. Go ahead, George. Yeah, the uh, NASDA team traced back the last usage of that uh, CCK mic, and it was uh, during the uh, new injection, so it may have been left in the space lab. Okay, so uh, IFM W-48 uh, for step three, wait till the uh, nozzle temps are greater than 200, and uh, I'll check back when complete. Uh, we'll put it in work right away. That's correct, Carl, and be advised you have uh, 11 hours of bullage, uh, already accomplished in the dump. Okay. I'd like to know that we've got live down right now
he was back there busily uh, working on experiments. The scientists back there have a real uh, difficult timeline. Here's a reenactment. I just want to show you how Rick filled the syringe to overpressure the pump. We, uh, we squeezed out a ball of water on the end of the straw, and that straw is not touching the syringe. The ball of water is just floating freely, and Rick is uh, pulling back on the uh, end of the syringe, sucking the water into it with no air. It really works slick. And what I'd like to do this morning is give you a brief explanation about one of the major facilities we have here on IML-2. And this is the AAEU, which is short for Aquatic Animal Experiment Unit. And essentially, this is an aquarium in space. Divided up into two halves. Over here, we have the aquatic package. And on the other side, we have the fish package. And in the aquatic package, we have four water tanks. I'll pull one out here. And three of these tanks have uh, red-bellied Japanese newts in them. And I'll hold this up so you can see it. We have one newt in two of the containers, and in one of the tanks we have two newts in there. And in all the tanks we have an egg chamber also with many different uh, newt eggs in them, up to 70 or 80 uh, eggs per uh, water tank here. So what we're doing with this experiment is having the newts lay eggs in space, and we're interested in how these eggs develop, multiply and develop under zero gravity uh, conditions. And we'll compare these eggs to those grown on the ground, the ones that have developed under 1G conditions. So this is one of our red belly newts. Uh, one of them that I looked at just a few days ago, if you were watching, has laid 36 eggs already, so we know we have a number of great eggs for the scientists to look at. Besides the astronauts here, we have uh, a, another tank with fish in it called Madaka. And these are small killfish, they're about the size of guppies. And we have four in there, two males and two females. And in this experiment, we're interested in the mating behavior of the guppies, of the Madaka fish here. And then on the uh, fish package, we have goldfish. You might have seen some of the downlink from this, and I'll shine the light on there, and hopefully you can get a view of some of the fish swimming by. We have six different goldfish in here, and uh, as you can see, they're looping around. They, they don't quite know which way is up, since we don't have a gravity vector here for them, and we've been watching and monitoring their swimming behavior for the last couple of days. We have a door up here that we open and close, to give them the day-night cycle, just like they would have on the ground. Okay, Don, we have uh, some uh, very good video of the goldfish now. Okay, copy that. Uh, let me know if you like the focus change at all. I tried to get it in the center, right on their eyes. Okay, PI says uh, focus is very good. Okay, copy. That's great. Okay, copy. Uh, cooler uh, transfer four containers but to PTC one, rack one, Charlie. That's a good copy. And uh, these uh, containers are 107 bone 3 from 108 bones 4. possible for Leroy. Uh, we are getting down link right now and we're about to go LOS.
Huntsville, Space Lab for Kimberly. Go ahead, Leroy. Uh, Kimberly, before I begin TEI, I'd like to uh, reposition the um, slime mold here. If uh, the PIs agree, I'm going to recenter the uh, target. That's affirmative, Leroy. The PI on the ground was just saying the same thing. We we're going to have you do it after TEI, but you can go ahead. Glad to that. Go, Chiaki. Yeah, Judy, thanks for waiting, and I'm ready to copy. Huntsville Space Lab on campus. We, we want to do APO4, right? We're going to power cycle it. That's affirmative. They were uh, resetting some of their internal software, and they need you to do a restart.
on uh, sending a Panam message home before he goes to bed. Panam's really nice. It's uh, nice to be able to communicate through the uh, modem back and forth with the uh, folks back home, and even you, Mario. And I, uh, I left this in probably a little long, and I should. I just uh, recording the MET and stuff here before I get started on the readings between the uh, commanders and pilot seat on the flight deck. I just thought it was really neat to be able to work with equipment like this. You really adapt to uh, microgravity very quickly, and it seems totally natural. Uh, just using a piece of equipment, setting it off to the side, letting it float, and then writing something down or going off to something else. Uh, it just seems like you've been doing it all your life once you've been up here for a while. And uh, my final scene uh, for this morning, Chiaki was able to talk to the uh, children at Tadabayashi School in her hometown via Sarex. Uh, Sarex has been a lot of fun. She wasn't talking directly via Sarex, but through a bridge in Hawaii. And uh, she really enjoyed that. The children enjoyed it immensely. And it, it really has been nice to be able to talk to uh, school children around the world. We've covered uh, the southern U.S., Tokyo, and Germany now uh, on this flight. And it always... Uh, is an encouragement to them and, and to us to hear how excited they are about uh, space exploration and answer their questions. Uh, I've been uh, looking at a new lens, well, not a new lens, a, a different lens on the uh, Hasselblad camera, uh, same lens we always fly, but instead of the infinity uh, stop uh, set on the ground, we're focusing it in flight and uh, looking at a different a uh, couple of different focusing screens to see how we might get uh, more accurate uh, pictures. Uh, we do an excellent job, as you know, documenting the changes in the Earth uh, on our shuttle missions, and the Earth is constantly changing, and we want to ensure that we have the best pictures possible when we get home.
time we go to maneuver to the calm attitude on time, about 10 minutes. It's very quiet uh, here in Mission Control. All of Columbia Systems continuing to perform uh, uh, in excellent fashion. There are no uh, issues at all in the room. Sonic booms announcing Columbia's arrival in the landing area. Landing gear is now down. Main gear touchdown. And nose gear touchdown. Columbia completing its 17th voyage in space, completing 236 orbits of the Earth, rolling out on runway 33 at the Kennedy Space Center, completing 6,143,000 miles. Flight repositioning completed and the probes are in transit. Thank you. On glide slope on center line. Okay, on and on. Columbia Houston, on glide slope on center line, surface winds 1504. Roger. Maneuver complete. Houston, Columbia, we'll stop. Roger, we'll stop. Welcome home, Columbia. Excellent, excellent job. Your, ex your record of 15 days on orbit for the shuttle has brought us closer to the next giant leap for humankind when we live permanently in space aboard the International Space Station. <laughs> 